All right, good afternoon and welcome to the second half of the semester. Uh, congratulations on making it this far. Hope you all did well on your midterm. Uh, they are all graded, so you can take a look at your grade. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Jack, uh, Andrew Jackson and Jacksonian democracy. And to start talking about Andrew Jackson, we've got to talk about the election of 1824. Um, Andrew Jackson is basically going to be robbed in this election. Uh, it's the first time since 1800 that you have more than one person running for president. You actually have four. You've got John Quincy Adams, you have Henry Clay, William Crawford, and Andrew Jackson. And an interesting side note, William Crawford's actually from Georgia. Now, when all the votes are cast, Andrew Jackson is going to get 43% of the popular vote. He's going to get 38% of the electoral college vote. And if you actually want to break that down, uh, Andrew Jackson gets 99 votes, John Quincy Adams gets 89, William Crawford gets 41, and Henry Clay gets 37. Now, because nobody gets a clear majority of the electoral college votes, it goes to the House of Representatives, and Congress decides who wins. Well, when it's all said and done, John Quincy Adams is going to come out of this as the president. Now, there are some people that are really upset because Henry Clay is going to withdraw his name and then John Quincy Adams is going to make him the Secretary of State. Everybody knows what happened. There was a backroom deal. Clay gave Adams his votes and then suddenly John Quincy Adams is president. Now, John Quincy Adams, he's not a very good president. He's worse than his dad was. Um, he wants a strong national government. The people don't want that. He wants to keep doing the first American system. The people can't stand that. And he doesn't understand how popular Andrew Jackson was. So things don't go so well for him. Now a little bit about Andrew Jackson. Um, he was born in North Carolina in 1767. I think he was born in a place called Salisbury. Uh, he's self-taught. He only goes to school here and there. Uh, he studies law for two years and then he becomes a lawyer. He basically says, I know what I need to know, I'm a lawyer now. Uh, he liked to fight, he liked to drink. Uh, he would gamble some. And everybody in the country knew who he was because he was a war hero from the War of 1812. In 1815, Andrew Jackson is the one who is leading the American troops in the Battle of New Orleans, which side note, the Battle of New Orleans happened a month after the war was already over. So Andrew Jackson is a war hero in a battle that should never have taken place at all. Now, he's going to marry a woman named Rachel, and this is kind of important. Uh, Rachel was married before she met Jackson. Uh, she was married to a guy who abused her, and she had children with him. Well, Rachel leaves her husband, moves in with Andrew. Andrew draws up divorce papers, sends them to the husband, and doesn't think anything about it, and Rachel and Andrew are going to get married. Well, the problem is, husband number one never signed the paper, so Rachel had two husbands. When this is discovered, it makes Andrew Jackson look really bad. Andrew Jackson goes and finds the husband, roughs him up, aka beats him up, and then forces husband number one to sign the paperwork. Then Rachel and Andrew are married again. Once all that's done, uh, Andrew Jackson, he's going to become the first man elected to the House of Representatives from Tennessee. He's going to serve in the Senate as well, and then he's going to say, all right, let's do this. Let's get involved in national politics. Well, four years of John Quincy Adams isn't very good. Let's go to the election of 1828. It's Adams versus Jackson part two, and this is a really, really personal campaign. It makes 2016 look like Skittles or something. During the uh, campaign, Rachel, who was already in poor health, dies because of all the pressure that is being put on her and Andrew Jackson. The news of the, the marriage issue comes out, and Adams calls Jackson a bigamist and polygamist and all this other stuff, and 
Rachel dies in the middle of the campaign. Um, so Jackson blames Adam for the death of his wife. Adam says Jackson is a crazy womanizer who's unfit to be president. And then there's this guy named Martin Van Buren who's in the background pulling the puppet strings and bankrolling Jackson's campaign. Now in the end, Jackson's going to win in the landslide. And you can see the numbers there, so I'm not going to go over them. And Andrew Jackson, he says he's going to be the common man's president, even though he's not common, and you know, the rest is history there. Now, his philosophy of government. Basically, um, he wanted to go back to the ways of Thomas Jefferson. Agrarian agriculture society, the state should be in control. Strong central government is bad. Concentrated power is bad. Reform is bad. And you can see a political cartoon of Andy right there, and you can see kind of what people thought of him at the day, at the time. Now there are a lot of problems while he is president. First of all, is the tariff of abominations, or the tariff of 1828. Now I'm going to try to make this kind of short, so you don't get too bored with the details. Basically, in 1828, there's a tariff or a tax on imports passed. It's meant to encourage northern industry. It's meant to keep out foreign goods and to have people buy American stuff. Well, the South primarily bought their goods from Britain, thought this was purposely to hurt them. And John C. Calhoun, who is the vice president of South Carolina, uh, he is He's vice president. He's from South Carolina. He is completely against the tariff secretly. Jackson's for it. And Calhoun's going to secretly write a, a, a letter and publish it called Exposition and Protest. And it says, hey, this tariff is unconstitutional. States can say a law is unconstitutional. And by the way, states can leave the union just as easily as they came in. This is the first time that secession is talked about. This is also, in many ways, the birth of the states' rights idea that's going to lead up to the Civil War along with ending slavery. Now, eventually, the president and vice president, they're going to make their points known publicly. They don't like each other. They don't get along. Secretly and in private, Andrew Jackson threatens the life of John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun says, you know what? I know the history of Andrew Jackson, I'm going to go back home. And Calhoun resigns from being vice president, but he comes back as a senator from South Carolina. Now eventually, once Calhoun is a senator, Jackson and Calhoun, they are going to kiss and make up. They're going to get rid of the tariff, and Calhoun is going to be asked to help design a new tariff. So in the end, it all works out, but at the moment, it was really, really big. So another problem called the Petticoat Affair or the Peggy Eaton Affair. Now, there was a tavern in Washington, D.C. that a lot of senators would go to just down the street from the, from the uh, Capitol. And Peggy O'Neill was the daughter of the innkeeper, the shopkeeper, if you will. She was married to a sailor named John Timberlake. John Timberlake was on a boat for the U.S. Navy, sailing overseas, serving his country, and Peggy meets a senator named John Eaton, and they start to sleep together. Somehow, Timberlake finds out about this affair and commits suicide. Either that or John Eaton has him killed. We don't really know for sure which one it was. But once the first husband's out of the way, Peggy and John marry. And Andrew, he's sitting there, you know what, this reminds me a lot of my dear departed Rachel. This sounds like a familiar situation. And he's going to demand that everybody needs to accept his wife. It, John and Peggy need to be accepted. In reality, nobody is going to, uh, to approve of this. In fact, basically Jackson's entire cabinet resigns. His daughter was serving as first lady because Rachel died. The daughter resigned from being first lady. It didn't go over very well. 
The one person who approved of it, Martin Van Buren, he's basically sucking up to Andrew Jackson and he's going to become the next vice president when Andrew Jackson gets reelected. Now going on from there, we've got a problem with the Second National Bank. The Second National Bank had been in operation since 1816. It was basically a clearinghouse where all the state banks would talk to each other and make sure money moved. Well, Congress decided to try and make the National Bank permanent in 1832 and they passed legislature saying that it would be permanent. But when it gets to Andrew Jackson, he vetoes it. And that's significant because it's the first veto in American history just because the president didn't like something. But even further than that, after Jackson vetoes the bill, he's going to withdraw the money from the national bank and redistribute it to the state banks. And a bank without money is broke. Now that's not the only thing he does with money. In 1836, there's something called the Species Circular incident. In 1836, Andrew Jackson is going to make it a requirement that any payments for federal land must be paid in gold or silver only. No American dollars, no American coin dollars, it has to be gold and silver. There was not enough gold or silver in circulation and that caused a big credit crunch uh, loans had to be called in by banks to try and cover loans to other people. There, it was a disaster. Now in the end, this credit crunch is going to affect the entire economy, not just the real estate economy. A recession is going to occur during the next president's term of office and it's going to be bad for like five years. It's the first really big recession that the country had. And you also have the birth of the Whig Party. And the Whig Party was created in the 1830s specifically to be against the Democrats. Anything that the Democrats were for, the Whigs were against. Democrats, anti-big government. Whigs, pro-big government. Democrats, anti-reform. The Whigs, pro-reform. You get the idea. Anything that they could be against, they were. Andrew Jackson's favorite color, blue. The Whigs would have said red. Now, in 1836, that's the first presidential election that the Whigs are going to take part in. And they don't just run can one candidate. They actually have four. Um, they've got a guy named Daniel Webster, who's from Massachusetts. They've got a guy named Willie Person Mangum, Hugh White, and William Henry Harrison. Because the Whigs divide their votes four different ways, Martin Van Buren wins the presidency. It's basically the third term of Andrew Jackson. Van Buren did the same thing Andrew Jackson did. Only it doesn't go well for him because of a depression that's going on. So when we get to 1840, that's another election. This time the Whigs are smarter. They are only going to have one candidate, William Henry Harrison. Van Buren is defeated. William Henry Harrison wins. It's 234 electoral college votes to 60. It's a huge defeat for Martin Van Buren. Um, by this time, though, William Henry Harrison's kind of old. He was a war hero in the War of 1812. He was the one who defeated Tecumseh from the last chapter, I think it was. And during his speech, his inauguration of speech, he wants to show that he's still a strong man, even though he's in his 60s. And he speaks for over two hours in the cold, in the rain. He gets typhoid fever and he dies 31 days after he becomes president. Now his vice president was a guy named John Tyler. John Tyler basically said he was a Whig just as get on the ballot. In reality, he was a Democrat and he did everything the Democrats would do. All right, so that's your quick, dirty look at Andrew Jackson. Some of you may want to do him for your research paper because he is one of the most interesting characters we have ever had in politics. A lot of bad, some good. Uh, we'll talk about him again when we talk about uh, westward expansion and removal of the Indians. 
But um, let me leave you with two things. Number one, next video I'll talk a little bit about the research paper so you can get started on that. And the other thing is your secret work. I have been tortured for the past week by a TV show called Bubble Guppies. My two-year-old will not stop watching. So in honor of my torture, your secret word for this week is bubble. B-U-B-B-L-E. All right, until next time, we'll talk to you later.